think we'll um we'll get ourselves we'll get ourselves going so um well i guess good, good afternoon everyone um welcome to the next webinar in our series going global with giant group um our focus today is on denmark um this is actually a a rescheduled webinar from a few weeks ago when we had some technical difficulties but um um everything seems to be working we keep our fingers crossed everything is going to work well today um i'm very pleased to be joined by paolo from csc who asked to introduce himself in just a moment but for those of you who may be joining us for the first time our format will be brief introductions we'll then go through a number of topics about operating in denmark um, if you do have any questions, um, please add them to the comments section and we'll see if we have any time at the end to go through them. Um, if we don't, we'll come back to you via an email with, with a response. So to start with, um, so I'm Charles Dorr. I head up uh, Giant Global Payroll, um, which is the international payroll division of the Giant Group. Now, the Giant Group provides really a, a unique proprietary workforce management software platform, offering everything from um, applicant tracking, vendor management, uh, screening, through to time management, bill and pay, and of course, employment, uh, and all done on a, on a global basis. Now, um, Paolo, could I ask you to perhaps to give us a, a quick overview of CSC? Sure thing. So. CSC is a company that supports clients with corporate secretary of governance. Uh, so we assist with uh, various types of filings and also assisting clients with expanding to other countries uh, outside of their home base. So we help clients navigate through complexities uh, to operate in other countries. Um, so also regarding to uh, having an address, we are able to provide addresses. We also assist with, of course, payroll services. So we like to say that we are the business behind business and that uh, we basically help you with all administrative tasks so that companies could focus on their core business. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Paolo. Um, so let, let's get into it all, all about Denmark. Um, I always like to, to start these sessions by let, let's assume that the decision has been made to expand into Denmark. Um, and with that being the case, what are, what are the key considerations that people need to think about when, when they said, yeah, Denmark's where I want to go? How do they go about doing that? What should they be thinking of? I mean, really, I think let's start off with the positives. Uh, so the positives is that are that the ease of doing business in, in Denmark. So it's been ranked quite high by the World Bank for doing uh, business, uh, the ease of doing business due to streamlined processes and also you know, relating to starting up a, a business here in, in Denmark. We have a very transparent regulatory environment, uh, so that helps to reduce bureaucratic uh, hurdles, also um, competitive tax system. So corporate taxes are relatively yeah, competitive, as I mentioned, and that there are a lot of incentives, for example, um, for research and development in, in Denmark. Um, so those are definitely the positives. Um, but I, I always say to uh, prospective clients who are wanting to enter into Denmark, the first thing that they need to consider is the question of PE or permanent establishment. So before any type of uh, registrations are done, uh, we highly recommend that uh, clients talk with a Danish legal advisor to discuss if their company uh, would be subject to permanent establishment uh, rules. Um, and naturally that would influence the type of registrations um, for the company. Okay, so just, just on that actually, uh, uh, what would what sort of activities might, might create a, a PE for, uh, for, for someone? Well, basically if the employees who are entering into Denmark have some sort of uh, authority. Uh, they're able to uh, negotiate deals, uh, they're invoicing from Denmark, things like that. So if they have a relatively high level uh, position and they have uh, the power to influence by default, that would establish permanent establishment. And then just, I think you we were about to say that, what are the different types of company structure then that are, are possible in Denmark? Well, there, there are really three 
types. Uh, one of them you could divide into two different types, but you have the limited liability companies and that's divided into either a private limited uh, company, which is in Denmark an APS, and a public limited company, which is called an AS. Um, then we have a branch office, which is usually a branch of a foreign company that is operating in, in Denmark. And then we have a simpler type of registration that is a employer registration or representative office. Okay. And do those different structures have, actually have different filing requirements or you, you basically do the same things for all of them? Well, yes, uh, actually they do. Um, so for both the limited liability companies and branch office, uh, by default, those are normally companies with PE. So you have obligations, of course, with uh, corporate tax filing, VAT. Um, with the branch office of a foreign company, you would also have an op added obligation to file the mother company's annual report uh, six months after the year end. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I think we actually jumped onto this next slide a, li a little bit early there, but um, um, once that company structure has been chosen uh, uh, and is in place, what are the main kind of operational activities that we need to consider? Would, um, could you elaborate a little bit more about the, like... Yeah, I mean, I, I, just looking here at the slide, I think we, we'd highlighted, you know, Things like workplace insurance, um, the uh, the uh, MIT ID uh, and eBox, um, those sorts of activities that I was thinking of. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Sorry about that. Yes, so there there are several things that you need to consider once you have your um, company registered. There are several things that you'd have to really consider, and Denmark really is a highly digitalized country, so. Uh, there are very few things that you would do over, you know, traditional mail. Um, so, for example, the MIT ID and eBox. So, MIT ID is a digital signature where companies are able to enter various statutory portals to do filings of all of all kinds, really. So, it is an extremely important uh, tool to have. Um, the mid ID also gives you access to the digital mailbox or e box. And again, as I mentioned, Denmark is very digital, and letters, uh, any notifications from the public authorities or uh, public offices are often shared in e box. And most often or not, those uh, letters are in. Danish, so it helps as well to have somebody who could read Danish, uh, understand exactly what is being communicated by the public authorities. So that's one thing. Some of the patoling, which is mm. um, translated as combined payment. So this is a type of social cost that, cons that consists of several social offices and it is a type of social cost that uh, often is neglected. So that's also shared through the digital mailbox. Um, so companies are required to pay uh, towards some of the battalion uh, each quarter. Um, if those invoices are not paid, companies do risk uh, being closed, uh, forcibly closed by the authority. So it's extremely important that uh, you pay this. And um, it's related really to, again, uh, various social schemes such as maternity leave, uh, vacation, um, having interns, and such. So, okay. okay. And then, um, and yeah. no, I was, I was going to say it's something that I've, I've pull, popped on the slide here that um, I know I've come across in in other countries um, was around the was around licensing. I know, for example, in Germany, you have the AUG license. Um, are there any kind of licensing requirements in, in Denmark that we should be aware of? So, I mean, as mentioned, in Denmark, it is relatively easy to, to do business. So, I mean, you could go ahead and start beginning, you know, running an operation if you have the capital, right? Um, really, the only limitations are regarding if you're, if you're entering know, the uh, investment banking industry, you need to be approved by the FSA. To be able to run business but if you're for example going to start up a recruitment agency there are really no uh licensing so you could go ahead and just get started fantastic 
And and again, something that um, that we've come across as we've been expanding our our network here at Giant is this need for a resident director. Um, so almost like having having boots on the ground in the country. Uh, any any need for that sort of operator or that type of person within Denmark, or can it all be done remotely? It can be done remotely. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the notifications from the authorities are in Danish. It does help that you have somebody on the ground who who is able to read Danish, who is able to weed through the the jungles of uh, yeah bureaucracy in in Denmark, right? Uh, so it does help to have a local person that could uh, assist with uh, yeah all kinds of things here with running a business, but it's not a requirement. Okay, fantastic. So um, now we're going to look at. Um... I guess pay, payment of of workers a little bit, and um, uh, I think just on the on the next slide, please, Betty. Um, in the UK, we have um, oh, sorry, I've completely jumped ahead and uh, missed missed out a section. Sorry. The next slide actually is around uh, something that we always like to check check in with is if there's any um, recent or or upcoming changes in legislation that we should be aware of. So I was jumping jumping ahead of the presentation there. So <laughs> let me bring myself back to that. Yeah, and anything that we should be aware of that's that's coming soon or has recently happened in Denmark? Well, I mean, there is actually a major legislation that's happening right now, and it is regarding uh, the having a time registration system in, in Denmark. So it is again, as it says here in the the slides, it's based on a forty eight hour rule and. Um, so basically what's happening right now is that uh, companies are now uh, being asked of the authorities to, to track uh, their employees' uh, working hours. So this actually takes into effect July 1 uh, this year. So uh, again, Danish employers must be able to document employees' daily working hours uh, through some sort of time registration system. Um, so the registration really is to ensure that uh, employees are not working more than 48 hours uh, per week so that they're you know, properly rested, right? Um, so there are really two significant uh, clarifications to this bill that needs to be considered. And the first one really is that uh, imp you know, employees are obliged to registered deviations to the agreed scheduling and it needs to be done in a very well relatively easy way um so the second thing is that uh, the registration of the employees total daily working hours um so that is what is actually being asked of so the specifications on the time period that the uh, employees are performing their work that's that's not a requirement only that you know you're registering the total working hours per day Okay, interesting. I mean, we we often work with uh, and assist recruitment agencies, and so we're dealing a lot with with contract workers, where they often put in a timesheet that has, uh, I guess, documentation of the hours that they've worked, because that's how invoices are generated and how payment comes through. But this piece of of legislation, you're saying, this is applying to everybody across yes. the board in Denmark. So whether if you're a full time employee of a company. You're still going to need to to register and and log your hours somehow. Exactly, unless you are a um, person of a higher uh, position. So, if you are, for example, uh, determining your own working hours, or if you're in sales, uh, if you're an MD or managing director of a company where you determine the number of hours that you work, it's not required. But for everybody else, uh, yes, you would need to uh, use some sort of time tracking system. Okay. And is and is there going to be a uh, kind of a I guess a, a a portal or some sort of way that this this information is going to be sent through to the authorities? Is there like a, a portal link or a website where you upload a spreadsheet, or has that not yet been defined yet? No, I mean the authorities have been they're quite flexible with uh, the type of registration that you will be that companies can do so it can be an excel document where you go in and you know register your time but um yeah it needs to be something that is readily ac uh, accessible and and reliable right so an excel spreadsheet i mean that could be manipulated 
um, by anybody, not just the employee. Then you also have to worry about GDPR. So that, you know, you can't have this uh, information out in the open so that they all can see, right? Um, there are systems right now uh, or providers of uh, time registration systems that are focusing on this. So uh, we're actually at the last stretch uh, right now to be compliant with the uh, with this new uh, legislation in Denmark. So. So it's the big okay. talk right now, and uh, people are just scrambling to make sure that they're compliant. But I mean, really, the only way that the authorities would be able to, to, you know, check is through audit. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Excellent. Thank you. So um, I will move on now to the the next question. I was trying to jump ahead to a, a few moments back, um, uh, and yeah, you know, what what I wanted to cover off was that obviously here in the UK, there's a number of ways of working. We have PAYE, sole traders, limited companies, umbrella companies, etc. Um, and, and really just wanted to ask, are there are there similar structures in Denmark with regards to payroll? Or is it is it literally just just PAYE? Well, <clears throat> I guess yeah, PAYE sounds to me uh normal full-time employees, right? So um sure. yeah, so we do have uh that as well. But then the other types of uh employments are if you're hired on an hourly contract um so that and then also if you're on temporary work or project work which is uh, basically you know employees who are working for a limited time period i mean there is also con you know contractors that are uh working but th they're considered not part of payroll so uh it's something that wouldn't be considered in a danish payroll understand if if someone did want to work as as self-employed or as a uh, like an independent contractor are there kind of specific criteria within denmark to to be allowed to do that or can you just make the the judgment call no i want to be a freelancer let, let me go and do what i want to do or, or uh, do some boxes need to be ticked with regards to that type of uh classification i think the main uh box to be ticked is that if a if a person would like to be a contractor um and they're only working for one uh employer in the eyes of the tax authorities that actually could be seen as being that contractor being employed by that employer so there's a risk there and of course there, there could be potential penalties uh withholding taxes that have not been uh calculated could be uh, enforced by the the authority so that's the main risk here if a person would like to go into yeah contracting um of course you also have to uh, invoice your work uh, to the employer and you have to have more than one um uh, employer or one uh, client i would say in this case if it's a contractor so since they're not technically employees and they need to be able to call the shots. So, I mean, they could take vacation when they want to, uh, they can choose their times. So if a employer or a client says that, um, okay, we would like to hire you and you're to work a certain time period, like, I don't know, nine to five, that could also be seen as being an employer. So, um, yeah, a contractor would be able to work freely basically. Understand. So that, again, I think that's very similar to um, the IR35 legislation we have here in the UK. Sort of that idea of being independent and not under the the kind of the supervision, direction, and control exactly. of, uh, of the end client. Sort of setting your your own way. Uh, and interestingly, I think on the 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 multiple clients, um, that's something that I've certainly seen across a number of countries in uh, in recent times. That kind of um, I guess definition. That to be considered a freelancer, you, you should have multiple clients as opposed to just working at, uh, at, at for for one uh, one in one organisation. Mm -hmm. um, do I take it though that it could be one after the other, as opposed to you don't have to be working on two projects at once? Could you work on one project and then work on a second project once that comes to an end? And would that sort of fall into the right criteria for for freelancing? I want to say yes. That that would be uh, fine if, if you if you have short stints of time, right? But again, it's something to be careful of. And as long as there's proper documentation that you, you know, in case the, of audit, then you're able to answer. Okay, perfect. And then just to come back to one more on on this slide. Um, so if we're running a, a payroll, so looking at the employed structures, 
um, what are the key elements that we need to be aware of um, when running payroll? Well, the type of employees uh, would be yeah, you'd need to consider. So if you have uh, full-time employees or salaried employees, uh, in Denmark, they work normally 37 hours a week. Uh, they accrue five weeks of vacation uh, in a year. So, um, and also that uh, they follow the, the Danish act on salaried employees. So there are certain criteria. Again, it goes back as well to the 48 hour rule. That's, that's always been part of the legislation. It's just being enforced now, but um, yeah, the Danish holiday act as well needs to be considered. So Denmark is very particular um, to the Danish holiday act. And uh, it, it is a unique holiday act in that it often uh, gets many uh, employers into trouble when they want to enforce uh, their own country's uh, holiday practice and uh, disregard the, the Danish holiday act. So um, that okay, is well, quite extensive. Can, I was going to say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? The, yeah. w what's, what's the actual entitlement then for the worker under the, the Danish holiday act? Do we have 24 hours to uh, our full day to go through this? <laughs> in, 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 yeah, in, a, in a brief format as opposed yeah, yeah. to the full. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. But uh, I mean, like key points really is that uh, the Danish Holiday Act uh, runs on two periods. So you have the accruing period where you accrue 2.08 uh, days of vacation each month. And the accruing period is from September till August the following year. So 12 month period. Then you have the usage period, which extends that 12 months period to by four uh, months. So 16 months. So you have to use those vacation days that you've earned in the accruing period in the, in the 16 month frame. Um, Otherwise, uh, if you have some uh, vacation days that you have not used, you could only have five days uh, paid out at the end of the year or uh, with an agreement, of course, with your employer transferred to the, the new calendar year. Um, days over five are lost both to the employee and to the employer. Um, so the idea here is that um, employers should not benefit uh, for the fact that their employees are not taking vacation days. So those lost days, uh, the value of those days are paid uh, to a, a fund called AFF, uh, which is a specific fund that it takes care of these uh, lost days. And the value of those lost days are then used towards charities. Okay. Oh wow, interesting. So yeah, so makes makes sense for the um for the workers to actually take the time off because the companies had to pay out the money anyway. Exactly. And the money itself, that that's another uh complexity here because in, in Denmark you accrue uh twelve point five percent holiday money on gross income. Uh and the gross income can be of course your your month's salary. Overtime commissions, uh, benefits in kind is also considered a, a holiday-based salary. Um, so that is the, the value. And the thing is, is that when you are a salaried employee, um, the Holiday Act states that you're entitled to paid vacation day. So the actual 12.5% holiday money accruals has no, it's not relevant until an employee should be terminated. Um, because the holiday act states that you're entitled to paid vacation. So you get your normal salary when you're on vacation. However, if you're terminated and you have uh, unused vacation days, then the value of the 12.5% accruals is paid to a, another holiday fund, which is called the, the holiday account. And when an employee is working with a new employer and they take vacation, they apply for their vacation payment through the vacation account. And can the workers kind of draw on it as, as soon as it's available? As in, you know, let's say they, they've done uh, three months of, of working in accrual. Can they draw on it straight from that point? Or do you have to get to the end of that first year before you can draw down in that you four can month draw it period out. you're talking yeah. about? You, you can, can draw it out. Yeah. Yeah. 
Perfect. So okay. and one other Next. thing I would like to add, this is the, the third mm. part. So again, it's, it's quite Two. complex. <laughs> so <laughs> no um, you also have this 1% holiday bonus. Um, so it's the same basis for the 12.5%. Uh, only difference is that it's actually being paid to the employees as gross income. So um, it's paid twice a year in Denmark. So uh, normally uh, employees have it paid in May and that covers September the previous year till May the current year, and then a second time in August payroll, which covers June to August. So altogether a 12 month period. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, let's let's move on just uh, again, uh, focused on the, the, the time in the bottom of my screen and uh, I know we're, we're approaching <laughs> our, our half hour anyway. Um, I guess I guess I always like to try and try and finish with asking what would be a, a I guess a key consideration or a key takeaway point if there was literally one or two things that you could summarize as the the key things for people to think about when um, considering operations in Denmark. What what would they be? Well, the first thing uh, as I mentioned earlier is to get the company evaluated for PE. So determine if uh, your operations would uh, be subject to PE. And if it is, then of course that would naturally affect the type of registration that you're going to be doing. The second thing would be to have a partner or somebody locally on the ground that could help you. You know, just going through the, the Danish Holiday Act, that that's a beast in itself. But having somebody local that could, you know, be your go-to person, your guide, so that way you're you're compliant with. Uh, yeah, taxes, uh, payment of corporate income tax, et cetera. So it's just to ensure that you're in good uh, compliance uh, with the authorities and, you know, with operating a business in Denmark. Absolutely. And I, I, I would uh, I would certainly echo that. Um, I think I, I always would recommend to, to work with with local expert partners. Um, we obviously engaged with CSC to assist up, assist us in setting up our operations in Denmark and and you guys have been a, an absolute massive massive help to us and, and continue to be on an ongoing basis um so look we've literally got two minutes so um uh, my colleague Betty is in the background um could I ask Betty are there any questions in in the chat that we could try and try and address or are we okay to, to wrap things up Hiya, um, we don't have any questions so far today, um, so I reckon that if anyone does have questions, they can contact you afterwards and you can address them specifically if that's okay. That sounds perfect. So look, Paolo, thank you ever so much for, for joining me today. Um, hopefully, and, and thank you to everyone who, who's been in on the session, hopefully you found uh, it interesting and, and a little bit informative as well. Um, please look out for the next session that will be coming up in, in a few weeks' time. Thank you ever so much. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers, everybody. Bye for now.